We come now to Psalm 24, a psalm about the great and sovereign God, the King of Glory. This psalm is simply titled in the original Hebrew, A Psalm of David. There are many people who think that this psalm was written upon the occasion of the entrance of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem during the reign of King David. You'll find that in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Whether or not the psalm was actually written to correspond with that event, I don't think we can say for certain, but it would certainly fit. Here is this wonderful short psalm, only six verses in length. Here we go, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Don't you love the expressive and expansive character of that statement? The earth is the Lord's. Now, don't forget that David was a noble and a successful king, but he was the king of a relatively small and insignificant kingdom. I mean, after all, what was the kingdom of Israel? It was small. It didn't have a lot of global importance. It wasn't a mighty empire. And one might easily think that the gods of the Egyptians or the gods of the Assyrians were greater because their kingdoms were greater. Yet David boldly and rightly knew that the Lord, that is Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, he was the God of all the earth. The earth is the Lord's. In other words, it's not like, well, he divides this part with the gods of Egypt and this part belongs to the Lord or this part belongs to the gods of Assyria. No, Forget those pagan idols that aren't gods at all. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. You see, it wasn't enough for David to say that the entire earth belonged to the Lord. He had to add that all its fullness also belonged to God. It's difficult to think of a more sweeping statement of God's complete ownership over everything. I mean, we think of what is the fullness of the earth? Well, it probably means everything that comes from its harvests, its wealth, its life, all the gold in every mine that has yet to be dug up from the earth. That's the belongs to the Lord. Every diamond, everything, just everything in the seas, everything's on the land. The earth is the Lord and the fullness of it. Everything belongs to the Lord. Now, there is a sense in which the world belongs to Satan. In passages like 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Satan is called the God of this age. And when Satan tempted Jesus with the promise of giving him the kingdoms of this world, Jesus didn't question the devil's ability to do so. I don't know if you remember that from the temptations of Jesus, Uh, for example, in each one of the Gospels where it describes Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And one of the temptations that Satan brought to Jesus was, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus never answered back and said, well, they don't, you don't possess those. You can't give them to me. There's some sense in which Satan is the God of this age. Yet Satan can only do anything at God's allowance. So God's ultimate ownership is true. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. Now, the Apostle Paul quoted this line twice in 2 Corinthians chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 26, and in verse 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He did that to establish that no food is in itself unclean, and that, in fact, there's nothing that actually belongs to the false gods that the pagans made their offerings unto. No, the earth is the Lord's, the world and those who dwell therein. God's ownership of the earth extends even to the people who live upon it. Through through the rights of creation, I mean, everything belongs to God because he created everything. But also through the rights of continuing provision, God has a claim upon every person who has ever lived. Now, why? Why does God have these claims? Again, I refer to the right of creation. That's going to be repeated now, or the idea is going to be established in verse 2. Check this out. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. God has the right to the earth and to all who dwell upon it because he created both the earth and everybody who dwells on it. Specifically, 
David looked back to the creation account of Genesis chapter 1, and he remembered the creation of the land in the midst of the earth's waters on the third day of creation. That's why he says he established it upon the waters. Now, to the best of our knowledge, David had never ventured more than a few hundred miles beyond Israel. And David had never seen a sea beyond the Mediterranean Sea. Perhaps also he saw the Red Sea. But David never saw a modern globe. He never saw a modern earth projection on a flat map. Yet he knew that the waters of the earth dominated the globe. So much so that it could be said that the earth is in the midst of the waters instead of the waters being in the midst of the earth's land. Isn't that amazing? He says he's established it upon the waters. Somehow David knew by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, no doubt, that it was the waters that dominated the earth and the land of the earth actually sits in the midst of the waters. Now to David, that might have seemed like a wonderful engineering marvel that God could establish the earth upon the waters. And it's the great God that has done this. Now, having established the greatness of God, now a critical question gets asked in verse 3. Look at this. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? Two questions, actually virtually the same question, asked twice for the sake of emphasis, as is the pattern in Hebraic poetry. The question is simply asked, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? You see, in light of God's sovereign ownership of the earth and everybody who lives upon it, David wondered exactly who had the right to stand before God. And this wasn't about mountain climbing, ascending the hill of the Lord. It wasn't about your ability to climb up a lot of steps, but it was about the right to come before God. That's why it's asked again, who may stand in his holy place? David there clarifies his previous question. David asked, Who has the right to stand before God at his holy temple in the holy place? Who can stand before God? Now, I'll tell you what I find fascinating about this question. This is a question that used to concern mankind much more than it does in our present day. There was a time when men and women genuinely wondered, what is required to make me right with God? There was a time when people actually asked that question. And I suppose there's some places and some cultures on some places in the earth today where people really do think much about that question. But today, in the Western world, and when I say the Western world, I mean uh, North America, I I mean Europe, I mean the cultures that are dominated by European and American and North American culture. I mean, in the Western world, it seems like the most asked question is not, what does it take to make me right with God? No, people want to ask the question, how can I be happy? Matter of fact, it seems that nobody asked the question, who may stand in his holy place? I want you to know something, that just because our culture doesn't ask this question the way that they should, it doesn't mean that it's not an important question. Now, I believe personal happiness is important, but it is not more important than being in right relationship with our creator and our provider. David not only asked an important question when he said, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? It's not only an important question, it's the most important question. Well, what's the answer? Look at it here in verse four. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Here, in three aspects, are the qualifications of the person who can stand before the Lord. The first aspect mentioned is who has clean hands and a pure heart. This speaks of a man or a woman who is both pure in their actions, that's the idea behind the hands, and they're pure in their intentions, that's their heart. That's the one who can ascend the hill of the Lord. That's the one who can stand in his holy place. 
I want you to understand something. David already established that God ruled the earth. Now he declares that God rules the earth on a moral foundation. God is concerned with the moral behavior of mankind. You know, when it says there, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, God could have said, well, the person who's really beautiful, you know, the person who looks really attractive by human standards. But he doesn't say that. He could have said, well, the person who's young. He doesn't say that. He could have said the person who's old. He could have said the person who's rich. He could have said the person who's poor. He could have said the person who's really smart. He could have said the person who's really simple. None of those things. All of those have their place in this world. But what God was fundamentally concerned about was a moral foundation. God is concerned with the moral behavior of mankind. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, clean hands are important for good hygiene. People are always washing their hands. Nowadays, they're always using that hand sanitizer. They want to have clean hands. That's important. But this speaks of much more than washing with water or even the best hand sanitizer. Remember, Pontius Pilate washed his hands, but they were not clean. No, this has in mind the person who is pure in their actions, what they do with their hands and a pure heart, pure in their intentions. And did you notice the next line there? Who has not lifted up his soul to an idol. The one who's accepted by God also rejects idolatry. Notice, not only in their actions, but especially in their soul. They have not lifted up their soul to an idol. And the last line of verse four, they have not sworn, excuse me, verse three, verse four rather, (laughs) They have not lifted up their soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. The words we speak are a good indication of the state of our heart. The inner person is revealed by what we say. That's in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. The one who makes deceptive promises before God, they find no welcome from God. Now, let's kind of review this. Who can come into the presence of God? Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. David understood all this from the general principles of the old covenant. And under the old covenant, for example, if you were to look in Deuteronomy chapters 27 and 28, under the old covenant, God promised to bless and receive an obedient Israel. He also promised to curse and afflict a disobedient Israel. So we see this. What David says in the first four verses makes perfect sense in an old covenant perspective. Now, outside the terms of the old covenant that God made with Israel, these answers of David may cause us to despair. It's easy to look at this list and see, you know what? My hands are not always clean. My heart is not always pure. Idolatry can be subtle and stubborn in my heart. I also find it too easy to make promises with at least a tinge of deceit where it says there in verse 4, nor sworn deceitfully. That's not even easy for me. So fortunately, God has established a better covenant, a new covenant through the person and work of Jesus Christ. You see, under the new covenant, we see that Jesus is the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Jesus is the one who has never lifted up his soul to an idol. Jesus is the one who has never sworn deceitfully. And those things Jesus had performed perfectly. Now, Jesus, in his perfect righteousness, took all my sin and the sin of all who believe. He took all our sin upon himself. And he says, I will give you my righteousness. I'll give you my clean hands and my pure heart. I'll give you my soul that has never been lifted up to an idol. I'll give you my tongue that has never sworn deceitfully. In his righteousness, it's given to all who believe we can ascend his holy hill and stand in his holy place. 
Brothers and sisters, I want to give you the assurance. You can take the promise of verse 3 or the invitation of verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? And when you see it requires the purity of life, the purity of action, the purity of motive that's talked about in verse 4, you can say, Lord, by faith, I have that righteousness in Jesus Christ. Now, that being said, David's principle is also accurate under the new covenant in this sense. The conduct of one's life is a reflection of their fellowship with God. John wrote it this way in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. He said this, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We might say that under the old covenant, a righteous walk was the condition for fellowship with God. But under the new covenant, a righteous walk with God is the result of fellowship with God, founded on faith. Yet under both covenants, God cares very much about the moral conduct of his people. He cares very much about the whole moral conduct of mankind in general, but especially with those who identify themselves as his people. Now, what kind of blessing comes to the righteous man? Take a look here at verse 5, where we read, He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Isn't that beautiful? He shall receive blessing from the Lord. God knows and cares about the moral behavior of men and women, and he rewards those who honor him with their lives. Now, this blessing may be sometimes understood in reward that God grants to the obedient, but other times it's to be understood as just the natural result of living according to God's wise order. Listen, God has established an order, a system, a a, a way that we should live. And when we obey that, there's blessing in it. Sometimes it's just the inherent blessing of living the way God wants us to live. But even more so, look at what it says there, verse 5. And he shall receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. David here spoke in the idiom of the old covenant, where right standing with God might be assumed from the life of the obedience. At the same time, David wrote of a received righteousness that came from the God of his salvation. We might say that the obedient life spoken of in Psalm 24 is the product of the received righteousness obtained by faith, the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, even with the important distinctions that we make between the old and the new covenants, It's a mistake to say that salvation was by works under the old covenant. Don't ever think that. What one might say in some sense that blessing was by works of obedience under the old covenant. But righteousness has always been from the God of his salvation. You see, under the old covenant, that faith was often expressed by the trust in the work of sacrifice. It would look forward to the ultimate perfect sacrifice promised by God and fulfilled in the work of Jesus at the cross. So here is a description of the blessed and righteous one, verse 6. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. This is Jacob. David says. It's David's way of identifying God's covenant people. These are the blessed and righteous ones. These are the ones who have entered into covenant with God, the covenant that that, that had its roots back in the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but then sort of had its branch or, or another aspect of it in the old covenant made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. This is, as it says there in verse six, the generation of those who seek him, the blessed and righteous ones do more than enter into covenant with God. They also pursue him with a continual seeking. This is something for each generation to do afresh. Are you part of the generation of those who seek him? Those who, as it says in verse six, seek your face. There the idea is intensified by repetition. The the, the scripture to seek your face is even closer than seeking him. And, And there it's also intensified by the use of that contemplative pause, that selah. That's what selah is all about. 
It's about pausing for a contemplation. Sometimes it might have been accompanied by a musical flourish as well. But the whole idea is to pause for contemplation. Now, verses 7 and 8. A little bit of a twist, a little bit of a change in the focus of Psalm 24 here. Here we read. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Don't you love the the triumph of that? Verse 7, lift up your heads, O you gates. You see, the first section of this psalm, verses 1 through 6, it declared the greatness of God. The second section spoke of how man can come into right relationship with God. Now, the third section welcomes God unto his people by the opening of the gates. And let me rephrase what I just said before. You could say verses 1 and 2 are the first section of the psalm. That's the greatness of God. Verses 3 through 6 are the second session, how man can come into right relationship. Now, the third section, verses 7 through 10, this describes God coming unto his people the opening of the gates. The idea is of the glorious procession of a king into the gates of a walled city. And the the, the city has a wall all around it for defense and protection. And of course, the gates are very important because if the gates aren't secure, then the walls aren't secure. So it's a very ceremonious thing. Open up the gates and open them wide because the king of glory is entering in. Now, Charles Spurgeon in his great work on the Psalms called The Treasury of David, he quoted an author named Evans who wrote this, quote, he's looking back to a time older in England, ready? Quote, this is from Evans, cited in Spurgeon, quote, when the king of England wishes to enter the city of London through the temple bar, the gate being closed against him, the herald demands entrance, open the gate. From within, a voice is heard. Who is there? The herald answers, the king of England. The gate is at once opened and the king passes amidst the joyful acclamation of his people. This is an ancient custom and the allusion to it is in this psalm. Now listen, I have no idea if they still do this in London today with the queen or any other monarch who may sit on the throne of England. But it's kind of picturesque to think in ancient times in England, the king coming up to a certain gate in the city of London and crying out, open the gate. They shout back, who's there? They declare it's the king of England. And then he comes in with joy and acclamation. It's the same idea here. The king of glory comes to the gates. And what does it say? It says that the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? He's the Lord strong and mighty. Think about it. The king of glory shall come in. Now, as I said at the very beginning of this psalm, there are people who believe that King David wrote this psalm either for the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem or the commemoration of the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. If so, you can see that, that maybe this is the idea of the king was coming into Jerusalem, coming in through the gates, and it was symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant coming in there. If that's the case, or even just if that concept is true, which seems to be so, we can make several connections to the idea that the king of glory shall come in. This was fulfilled when the Ark of the Covenant came into Jerusalem. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 11 through 18. This was fulfilled also when the ascended Jesus entered into heaven. Do you remember when Jesus ascended on high? But how about this? This is also fulfilled when an individual heart opens to Jesus as king. Can't you see this being a symbol or or just a picture for us in our mind? That that's it's as if uh, my heart. Is, is a walled city resisting Jesus Christ. And then Jesus comes to my heart and he says, here I am, open the gate. And I say, who is uh, desiring entrance? And he says, it's the king of glory, the king of the universe. I desire to come into your heart. And then I say, come, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You see, the idea is plain. 
It's assumed that when God is welcome with open gates and doors, he is pleased to come in. The king of glory will meet with his people when he is approached correctly and when the doors are open to him. You know, the the idea that somehow the doors or the gates might be opened to God, yet he would not come into a man, it's not even considered. Like, like, Like somebody would open their heart wide open to Jesus and Jesus said, nope, not for you. You see, we have the promise. It's in James chapter four, verse eight. That when we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, this idea is presented as a plea from Jesus unto his people. He says this. Again, this is Jesus speaking unto his people. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus promised this. Open the door, and I will come in. That's what we need to do. We need to open the door to Jesus. Now, I I know it's possible to overthink this. We overthink this like this. Well, I, I can't open the door unless God does a work in me first. And I don't know if God's done that work or not. Maybe God has. Maybe God hasn't. I, I don't know. I don't want to open the door if it's not God leading me to do it. We just, oh, listen, open the door of your heart and Jesus will come in. Now, I know that you can't open the door of your heart unless God is working in you, but don't think about that in the moment. In the moment, just say, I want Jesus. I'm going to open up the door of my heart to him, and he will come in. I like what F.B. Meyer said about this. He said, we must have the king of glory within. To have him on the outside, even though he's on a through, no, that's no good. I'm paraphrasing F.B. Meyer here. But he said, we need to have the king of glory within. So verse eight, who is the king of glory? It is the Lord strong and mighty. You know, perhaps even with a touch of amazement here, David notes that the same God who responds to man's welcome is still the king of glory. He's still mighty in battle. His openness to man does not diminish his glory or his might. Now let's take a look at the last two verses, verses 9 and 10. And what's fascinating about this is verses 9 and 10 are virtually the same as verses 7 and 8. What we have here is a dramatic example of repetition for the sake of emphasis. This is very Hebraic in uh, Hebrew uh, poetry here. Ready? Here we go. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts He is the king of glory, Selah. Again, did you notice that in verse 9? Lift up your heads, O you gates. As is common, as I said before in Hebrew poetry, repetition communicates emphasis. The ideas of verses 7 and 8 were so important and so glorious that God said, I'm going to say them twice. Now, when Jesus entered Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, Matthew tells us that the city asked the question, who is this? That's in Matthew chapter 21, verse 10. If they had known who it was, their response should have been, the Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. And notice those two ideas. First of all, the Lord of hosts. Do you know what it means that he's the Lord of hosts? The idea of the Lord of hosts is that he is the commander of heavenly armies. Hosts are like ordered ranks of soldiers. And the idea of the Lord of hosts usually has the idea of angelic armies. He commands all the hosts, all the armies of heaven and earth. He commands everything. So he is the Lord of hosts and he is the king of glory Selah. This psalm rightly ends on a reflective pause. It is no small thing that the king of glory stoops down to be received by men and to receive man. I think it's interesting. We are here at the end of Psalm 24. And G. Campbell Morgan connected three psalms of David. Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24. And he connected them in an interesting way. 
He says, if we were to put it in our time, yesterday he passed through Psalm 22. Today he's exercising the shepherdly office of Psalm 23. Tomorrow he will exercise finally the authority of Psalm 24, reigning as the king of glory over all the earth in the fullness of measure. Let's conclude with this. How does Psalm 24 point to Jesus? Well, again, we spoke about this very clearly about what we have in the new covenant that Jesus established. But let me just give you three additional ways that Psalm 24 points to Jesus. Number one, when it speaks of God as the creator in verse two, do you remember that? Verse two, we read this, for he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the otters. God created the earth and Colossians chapter one, verse six tells us that Jesus was the agent of God's creation in the creation of all the earth. It says of Jesus in Colossians one, six, for by him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on, on the earth. If Jesus created everything, then when it mentions the creative glory of God in verse two, it's talking about Jesus. Then secondly, when it asks who may ascend into the hill of the Lord in verse three, really, is that not referring to Jesus who not only ascended into the hill of the Lord in any earthly sense, but he ascended into heaven on high and he was gloriously seated at the right hand of God, the father on high. This is the true ascension not just going up to a temple or a tabernacle on earth in Old Testament times. No, what it's really referring to in the ultimate sense is the ascension of God the Son into heaven. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Jesus, the one who had clean hands and a pure heart. Jesus, the one who had not lifted up his soul to an idol. Jesus, who had never sworn deceitfully. That one described in verse four, in perfect measure, Jesus is the one who has every right to ascend to the hill of the Lord, to heaven on high, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Finally, when in verses seven and eight, and 9 and 10, remember the repetition. When this psalm welcomes the king of glory, you know who it's welcoming. It's welcoming King Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let him reign in your life. Father, that's my prayer. I pray that everybody who views this or listens to this would have their heart stirred by the glory and the majesty of our great King. Thank you for this great Psalm that draws our attention to our great King. And thank you for the right of access that we have to your throne in Jesus Christ. We praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.